Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Eric. Uh, and I'm an Elixir developer at ICanMakeItBetter.com. And uh, as you said, I'm also an a core team member. Um, so this talk is about about the tooling, um, specifically about dependencies and packages, uh, and how those dependencies work in Mix, our build tool, and Hix, our package manager. Uh, so let's start out with Mix. Uh, Mix is the build and project management tool. Uh, you use it for a lot of things in your day-to-day -day life. You can use it to generate a new project, it compiles your code, you run tests, it handles your dependencies, and you can do almost anything else you can think of because it's extendable through mixed tasks, uh, which I will show in more detail later on. Um, at the core of your mixed project is the mix file or mix.exs file. It looks uh, like this when it's generated. Uh, it contains your uh, project configuration and uh, it's loaded automatically when you run any mixed tasks. And this is how dependencies are defined. Uh, you can see that we are defining Poolboy, a dependency on, on GitHub. We're also defining the Ecto dependency, which uh, we have not specified on how to fetch, which means that Mix will treat it as a Hicks package uh, and will be delegated to the external Hicks tool. And uh, we have a bunch of tasks for handling dependencies. We have Debs Get, Debs Update, and so on for, for fetching, for updating, for <coughs> listing your tasks, and so on. And with the dependencies, we have repeatable builds. Uh, and what that means is that uh, we have a mix log file which stores uh, it stores the information about each dependencies. Uh, so for example, if you look at the bottom, we have WebSocket client where we store the URL and how to fetch it and the JIT uh, uh, hash. And for, and for hex packages, we can just store the, the package name and its version. Um, because they're all unique. And this file should be committed so that all users of the project will get the uh, will get this file and they will get the same versions of each dependency as as the one you're using and and the one you have been testing. Uh, and we also support rebar and makefile dependencies. Um, as long as they follow OTP conventions. Um, so any project that has a rebar.config or a make file, we can compile. And for rebar projects, we can also fetch the sub-dependencies of the project. And this is really useful because there are a lot of great uh, projects in the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem already that we can uh, that we can use. Uh, so let's talk about Hex. Uh, it's the package manager that we recently created, or um, about. It's. I think it's been. Uh, it's been in production since April. Um, and like uh, Jose said earlier, it's it's a package manager for the whole Erlang ecosystem. Uh, not just for the e e Elixir world, and um, uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Yep. So here are the download statistics for packages. So as you can see, we started out in April with a very modest month, and uh, it goes up to November. So last month we have we had over seven thousand package downloads. So it's growing, which is nice. <coughs> So next I'm going to talk a bit about some of the internals of Hex because I think they're interesting and uh, it shows how it's designed. Um, so Hex, so we have Mix which is 
the build tool, which handles dependencies. And we have Hex, which is the package manager. And it's an external application, uh, so, you need to, so you need to fetch it separately. But we have, but we have very convenient tasks for, for fetching and installing Hex. Uh, and it integrates uh, through Mix, uh, with Mix tasks. So, uh, Hex exposes a bunch of Mix tasks which you can use to, to publish packages, you can register as a user, you can um, search for packages and so on. And, and to show quickly how mixed task works, uh, this is an example mixed task. So this is just an Elixir file, um, and um, a mixed task is just a module which uh, exports the the run function with one argument, which is the uh, which is the uh, it's the command line arguments, uh, and it's prefixed with the mixed tasks uh, uh, name. Uh, so when mix starts, it looks through the whole code load path, and it loads uh, and it loads any modules that matches this interface. Uh, so this means that you can define tasks in your own project or any dependency that you're using can also define uh, tasks that will be available to you as a developer. And uh, Ecto and XRM are two great examples of this. So Ecto is a, is a database library uh, and it supports uh, database migrations. So we have a task, um, uh, Ecto gen migra uh, migration that generates all the boilerplate for a migration file. Uh, and then we have the ecto migrate task that will run the migrations against the database. Uh, and EXRM is a, is a release management tool. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it uses uh, Relix. And for compiling um, the release, it can fetch a configuration uh, from the uh, from your mix file, and you can fetch uh, the OTP configuration for your application from the mix uh, configs. And there are other parts of mix that are extendable. For example, you can extend the compilation uh, stack. So by default, we compile Elixir files, we compile uh, Erlang files, uh, Lex and Yake, which are the uh, Lex and parser files. But you can extend these. So for example, um, a library uh, that, for example, implements protocol buffers can uh, can add a task that compiles the protocol buffers to to beam code, and this is exactly how uh, Hex integrates as well. So there, so as you saw earlier, there are tasks for for publishing, updating, and so on. But Hex is not a dependency like Ecto and EXRM. Uh, it's actually installed as a as a code archive, and a code archive is basically just a, a, a zip file containing Beam and app files, um, and this is not <coughs> it's not an Elixir specific feature. It's actually supported by the Erlang code loader, um, and a code archive looks something like this. So this is how it works. We have the so this would be a zip file containing in the hex.app file and the beam files for all the modules. And the and code archives are uh, loaded from your home directory. So hex would install into into dot mix forward slash archives. Uh, so it loads everything from there. So the tasks are available from uh, from hex. Um, there is one small issue with card, uh, with card archives though, and it is that um, they are compiled code. Uh, and with e Elixir, we don't have binary compatibility between, um, between minor versions. So we need to make sure that when you change uh, your Elixir version, we need to make sure that it's easy to update your uh, Hicks application or, or um, your Hicks uh, tool. Uh, right, yeah. Um, 
and we can do that by um, so there is a, a a mix task for uh, for installing hex, and uh, so it hits a URL on the hex API server, and that your and that URL contains the the Elixir version, and the hex API server can examine the URL or the or the get parameter. And it can redirect to the correct hex version so that we can install it. Um, so we can install the correct version for your Elixir version. Uh, and we'll also include a list of all hex versions and Elixir versions with the register file, which is fetched when you, which is automatically fetched whenever you do anything with uh, with hex. And we do that so that we can immediately tell you if there has been a new uh, hex version uh, released. So we get the message. So you will get a message immediately. And Elixir version managers are also encouraged to to swap out the the mix uh, the mix archives uh, a directory when you uh, when you change between Elixir versions, so that you don't have to fetch checks. Uh, so you don't have to fetch checks every time that you change versions. Um, Lastly, I want to talk about the uh, remote converter. Um, and to talk about the remote converter, we first I want to start from the beginning, from the uh, from the mix depth get call. And that starts out with that we run the the mix core converter, which is part of mix. Um, and the mix converter is what's so if you remember from the mix file, we have the definition of pool boy and ecto. And pool boy may have some dependencies, and Ecto may have dependencies that we need to fetch as well. So we need to, so we need to, uh, so we need to, we need to traverse the tree in a breadth-first fashion, and um, uh, we need to do sanity checks on this tree, and we need to make sure that you have a unique set of dependencies that are not conflicting. And we start out by uh, by getting the dependencies from the mix file. And as we're traversing this tree, we are fetching dependencies uh, along the way. So we fetch ecto, and we get the ecto mix file. We can see if there are any any more dependencies, and we keep on traversing. And um, at this step, we are skipping uh, hex packages because we need to do them in a later stage, which I will talk about shortly. Uh, so. So two dependencies, so you can have two different dependencies that in turn depend on the same dependency. So for example, there are a lot of libraries that are using JSON, for example. So they can depend on the same JSON library. So we need to make sure that we can converge those two different dependencies to a single dependency. And we do that by checking that, for example, for, uh, for deep dependency, we check that the, that the URLs are matching and that the uh, checksum or the tag are also matching. And if they are not matching, we cannot converge them, so we mark them as diverged. And we will error and print a message to the user. Um, <coughs> you can fix this by overriding in the top level uh, mix file. So if you know that you can use a specific version of your library, uh, you, can, you can override that in the mix file. So after we traverse the and the, uh, the tree, we need to flatten it to a single list and we need to uh, store the dependencies because for Elixir it's important to compile dependencies in the correct order because we, might, uh, because we may have compile time dependencies uh, yeah, we might have compile time dependencies between dependencies so we need to make sure that they are compiled in the correct order So then we run the uh, remote converter, which is how mix hooks how hex hooks into mix. Um, so we run the uh, remote converter immediately after the normal converter, and we run uh, and we run the the, uh, the remote converter on the hex packages that we skipped uh, during the first traversal. And we need to do this because. For the remote converter, we 
we run a uh, we run a dependency resolver, uh, which I will talk about more in uh, later on. But it basically finds a a matching set of dependencies for all of your requirements. Uh, but before we can do that, we need to update. Uh, we need to make sure that we have an updated registry, and the registry is is where we keep all the packages in the hex repository. We also keep uh, their versions, and we keep the requirements, the version requirements, and the dependencies between different package versions. And today. This is just a single ETS file that, we'll, that, uh, uh, that you download. Uh, and this file is cached locally, so if your internet is down or something like that, you can still use uh, hex. So we need to fetch and update this file every time you, uh, you run dependency resolution to ensure that you have an updated copy. And today we have slightly over 300 packages and over 3,000 package versions. So this file weighs in at about 70 kilobytes when compressed. So you need to fetch those 70 kilobytes every time you run your dependency resolution. And uh, this is going to be a problem in the future um, because that file is going to grow. Uh, so we're working on a different format for storing the dependencies uh, and for um, and to be able to fetch just the latest updates uh, of, of, of the registry, so you don't fetch uh, everything every time that you run uh, hex commands. So there's definitely room for improvement, and we have some plans for fixing that. So after we fetch the registry, we need to run the, the dependency resolution. And as I said earlier, it, uh, the, the dependency resolution is what finds a set of dependencies that are ensured to, to be matching and working with each other. So if, uh, if you remember from the mix file that I, show, uh, that, I showed, uh, that I showed, there was a version requirement on Ecto, so it said that it should be at least version 1.2. And, and all dependencies have these version uh, requirements on each other. So we need to find a matching set uh, that we know are assured, that we know are working with each other. And we do that by uh, first taking the dependencies from the mix file. Uh, we store them in a list of uh, pending, uh, that, that, that we call pending requests. And uh, in step two, we take the next pending, so we pop uh, a package from the list. Uh, we compare it against any activated packages, and activated packages are those that we have found a matching version for. If there are no matching uh, packages, we need to backtrack to a later, uh, uh, to an, no, not to an later, uh, to, an, uh, to a, a state that we have stored earlier. Uh, but if we don't have to backtrack, we can activate that package. So an activated package is, is a package that we have found a version for. After we activate it, we add the children of that dependency. So if that dependency has any more sub-dependencies, we need to add them to the pending list of packages uh, that, we need to, that, that, uh, that, that we need to resolve. At this point, we save state for backtracking. So if we fail at an earlier stage, we can revert back to this state and, com and, and, and continue. Instead of getting the, if we look at uh, step two, we find the latest match uh, release. Instead, we'll try another uh, version uh, of the package. We will keep on going. So this dependency resolution uh, will always find a matching set of dependencies if it's possible. So that's good. Uh, the problem with it is that it's very high time complexity. I haven't seen or heard anyone that have problem with uh, that the dependency resolution is taking a long time today. Um, so it might work for the future as well. Uh, but another problem is that with this with this uh, way of trying 
every possible solution, it's very hard to, f to give a good error message to the user. So for example, if the, if the resolution fails, it failed for some reason because some requirement couldn't be satisfied. But it's hard to find a, a specific place where that requirement was wrong since we are just trying every possible solution. So we're trying to find a way to improve this way of doing the pen resolution so we can get better error messages. So the last step when running mixed steps get and after we have uh, done the resolution we need to fetch packages. Uh, and packages are just packaging the tarballs uh, which I will show shortly. And just like with the register file, the tarballs are cached locally and we will only download them if they actually change. So we're doing conditional HTTP requests so that we don't fetch uh, uh, things that you cache locally. Uh, and packages are only allowed to change. So when you push uh, or when you publish a package, uh, you should test the package and see if it works. If it doesn't work, you have a one hour window to update the package. After that, it's that, uh, that version is locked down. And if there is any bugs, you need to push a new version. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're cached locally, like I said. Um, and they are also uh, fetched in parallel. So even without the parallel fetching of packages, the, uh, the in, in my test it's about 10 times faster than fetching JIT, uh, JIT dependencies. And with parallel fetching, it's basically limited by bandwidth, um, since we're just fetching from a uh, from a content. Uh, we're just fetching from a content uh, delivery network, and. This is what a package tarball looks like, roughly. Uh, so we have an uncompressed uh, tarball containing uh, a version file, which is just a version of the tarball. So if we need to do any backwards incompatible changes to packages, we can I increment this version. Uh, we also have the checksum, which is used to check the integrity of the, of the tarball. So, this, so it's a checksum of all the other files in the tarball. We have a metadata file, which is just an Elixir uh, source file, which only contains uh, a map with the uh, metadata for, for the package. We are changing this file to an Erlang term file, so that it will be user for, uh, uh, so, it user, so it will be easier to use from, uh, from Erlang. And finally, we have the uh, the contents of the package tarball, which is compressed, um, and and it's it's what contains your project. So it contains your uh, your source files, it contains uh, your mix file and any configuration that is needed to run and to run and compile <coughs> the, the dependency. And the reason why it's source source code and not uh, compile code. Is because source uh, because source code uh, is basically easier to work with because for compile code you need to make sure that you are matching the beam version uh, or the uh, Erlang runtime version. You also need to make sure that you are matching the correct Elixir version, and for uh, and for Elixir packages. Um, or for, yeah, the compile output, since we have meta programming, the compile output could be, uh, could be different depending on how you configure the, uh, the project and how you configure the dependency. Yes, yeah, so that's basically why we have uh, source code, but we are, um, we're planning to also support uh, uh, pre-compiled versions. So <coughs> If you used Homebrew, they have this concept of bottles. So, so uh, at the at the bottom of it all, it's just source code. But they have bottles which are 
which are bundles of pre-compiled code that they have compiled for the different uh, architectures and versions that they need to uh, uh, that they need to run against. So, uh, for example, for uh, for Erlang packages, this could be very useful because they because most uh, because most Erlang packages wouldn't uh, wouldn't change uh, depending on how you configure the dependency. And you can use Hex with Erlang today. So first of all, we have uh, a standalone mix uh, binary, which is just an e-script which contains mix and e elixir. Uh, so you can use that to to fetch uh, to fetch your dependencies and to fetch your Hex packages. And you can also use mix for your Erlang projects because mix compiles. Uh, it compiles, uh, it compiles Erlang source code as well, and there are uh, open source open source libraries on GitHub that have tasks for, uh, uh, for example, common tests and for e e unit and so on. So you can actually use Mix for your Erlang projects. Uh, the only problem is the Mix file, which is e Elixir, but we are planning on supporting the mix file as a Erlang uh, file as well. And we're also, or we, or we want, and we're trying to integrate Hex with, uh, uh, with existing tooling. Uh, for example, uh, Rebar 3, which is being developed currently, we're trying to work with them to uh, make them able to use uh, Hex packages, which could be very nice. And finally, I want to talk about Hex PM, uh, which is the API and uh, server side of Hex. So on Hex PM, you can you can uh, browse the documentation for Hex. So if you want to learn how to publish packages and so on, you can uh, you can go there. We, you can also browse for packages and their versions and their and check what the dependencies they have. We also show. Um, also show download sta uh, stats uh, for packages, uh, and this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, so this is hosted on a web server, uh, but the registry and, and the tarball are hosted on Amazon S3, which means that if the web server was to go down for some reason, we can still have, uh, you can still do deploys and you can still fetch packages and use Hex. Uh, the only thing that would go down is is the website and the ability to push new packages. <coughs> but you would still, but your deploys would still work, and so on. Um, on the website, we will we also host documentation for uh, for packages, because in Elixir. Um, we have first class documentation uh, through uh, what we call here docs. So in line in your code, you can, you can have documentation. And we use a, a tool called XUnit to, to generate HTML documentation uh, from the docs. And um, you can just run, so from your project, you can just run mix hex.docs and it will uh, use XUnit to generate and compile the documentation. It will push the documentation to to Hex, and it will be available and hosted on hexdocs.pm. And uh, this is what doc the documentation will look like. Uh, yep. Finally, I want to talk about what we want to do in the future. So I said I talked briefly about that we want to support uh, Erlang projects uh, and that could happen through Rebar 3. Uh, so we're working with them to make sure that uh, they can use our API and they can use our uh, registry and they can fetch and download the tarballs and so on. Uh, another thing we want to do is support uh, eScripts. So today when you use a package, 
it's it's sandboxed to your local project, and um, so it's uh, so there's no way to install a package globally. But what we want to support is is is, is installing uh, eScripts globally. So uh, uh, firstly, support that uh, through Mix. So just installing the eScript through uh, through the JIT uh, uh, URL, which would just like how if you would compile a dependency, we would we would uh, compile that project, and we will build an eScript from it. But we could also support it for hex packages, uh, and use the existing infrastructure in Mix and Hex to uh, to uh, to fetch and download uh, and install uh, the package. And if there is, if you want to know anything more about what we're doing in the future, you can go to the uh, to the uh, to the GitHub repositories where we have an initial list where we're discussing everything. And there's also a proposal about eScripts on the core mailing list. Um, and that's it. I think we have a few minutes for uh, three minutes or three questions uh, that we have time for. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, one question. Uh, how much uh, mix and hex is influenced by Lenning and or, or Bundler? Did you borrow some logic from them? Yeah, so mix is heavily influenced by Lenning. Uh, I think the guy who, who started by, uh, yeah, you're saying? Repeat the question. Yeah, okay, uh, so I repeat the question. So, how much of mix is influenced by Lenning and how much of hex would be influenced by Bundler and so on? So, um, yeah, uh, Mix is heavily influenced by Lenigan. The guy who started work on it, I think, was part of, of, the, of the developers for Lenigan. And for Hex, um, there's a lot of inspiration from all the major uh, package managers like NPM and RubyGems and Bundler, of course. Um, actually, the new format that we're going to use for the, re uh, for the registry uh, was uh, was taken from uh, from Ruby Jumps because they have big issues where the registry was way too big for them. Uh, so they have some nice solution for that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, very much impressed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, any more questions? In the back. So the question is if there is, if there are any tools for release managers uh, for release management in in Mix, and uh, there's no support for that in Core Mix, but uh, we check the earlier slide. EXRM, which is a library, is a library which wraps uh, Relix. It's used for generating releases. Uh, so you can just add uh, EXRM as a dependency of, of your project and the task for generating releases would be uh, uh, available to you. Yep, uh, any more questions?